My name is Gabi Cafarire, and I work with the food banks in the Middle East and Africa. So, <laughs> thank you. Oh, it's, it's such a pleasure to be with all of you and, and to learn from all of you so that we can share and exchange things region to region. Um, today, we've heard a lot about climate change and the impact that it's having on food systems around the world. Now you will hear from GFN members Kenya, the Philippines, and Colombia on the impact extreme weather has had on their communities and how they're responding. You can find the speaker bios and links in the Feedloop app, um, and we will share the presentations on there as well. So I'd like to invite Executive Director from Food Bank in Kenya, John Gathungo, to come to the stage, please. Thank you, Gabi. My name is John uh, Gathungo, the Executive Director of Food Bank in Kenya, and also a co-founder of the organization. Now, um, Food Bank in Kenya was initiated in the year 2017 and uh, registered by the, fully registered by the government of Kenya through the NGO Council. Now, our services include uh, securing food and distributing the same food to the very vulnerable people within the society. Food Bank in Kenya work closely with other like-minded organizations, but at the same time, make sure that our beneficiaries are the people that really, really need what we have secured uh, from our donors. We have several uh, uh, programs that uh, we learn, and one of our great program is the Agriculture Recovery Program. We realized that before COVID, we used only to do or secure food uh, from the retail market, the dry foods. But we realized during COVID that there were virgin areas that we had not ventured into. And Kenya is an agriculture country. Almost the 3% of Kenya gross domestic product comes from agriculture. About 40% of the population is employed by, through agriculture. And the sector also uh, covers like 70% of the rural population rely on agriculture. And those are the people that Food Bank in Kenya works closely with. So when we realized this, we found that we could venture into the area of agriculture recovery in order to feed many more people uh, within our society who were suffering. At the same time, there was so much food that was getting into loss in our farm. I, John, was raised and I was also born by the slopes of Mount Abadea. That is a very productive area. My parents were small-scale farmers. And when I went to the urban, uh, urban centers, I could find that most people were suffering and didn't have something to have on the table. And at the same time, there was so much that was going into laws in our farms. So this motivated us with other members of our organization that we started Food Bank in Kenya to come up with an idea. And that's when we registered Food Bank in Kenya we thought that with the much food that was getting to loss in the small, by the small-scale farmers, what they were producing, if that food could be fed to the people that were getting loss, uh, people would really benefit. So we are going to show you a video and to take you through what Food Bank in Kenya does. And later on, my colleague, Moses, who is in charge of operation and logistic, will lap up everything. Thank you very much. We started uh, Food Bank in Kenya based on the need that we saw in our society because there was so much that was getting to loss 
But at the same time, there were so many people that were going hungry each and every day. We have uh, several uh, programs learning, that is for food sourcing. And uh, we especially have, one of them is uh, agriculture recovery, whereby we work very closely with the large scale farmers. We also work closely with the small scale farmers. With the large scale farmers, mostly what we get is donations. But with the small scale farmers, on whom we work closely with, we usually, at times when there is bumper harvest, purchase and also they donate to us. And mostly, like at times like this when we are experiencing drought, most of what we are getting from the small scale farmers is purchased because we want them to have something probably for the next season. That is the seeds and even some fertilizers to plant. Na tuwa medeli ya raithi, maga diye kohe ya doage, ale ya mena madhena. Na netuke naga muno todo hirio isisito iti oraga, le ya moka ne matu oko waga. Neto otole maga hirio nyige, lege ikeda kore la goko. No ne moka maga tohono kia, maga togole ya nabe ya dhena hidoto kama negera, maga digota hidi ya doa siyo. We also do food drives, and these we work closely with the retailers, that is the supermarkets, and any other kind of retail markets that we have. Uh, around the country. We usually distribute our food to the very vulnerable people within our society. One of uh, the groups, the agencies that we donate our food to is through our school feeding program, whereby we have like 7,200 kids that benefit from school meal on a daily basis when they are at school. We have like 7,000 kids that we also feed from the children's home on a daily basis. So in total, we have over 10,000 children benefiting from food on a daily basis from Food Bank in Kenya. FBK have given us food for now about one year and uh, we've had a lot, a lot of food. I cannot even quantify the kind of food that they've given us because sometimes we thought it, it was going to be monthly, it was going to be quarterly, but it's every other time. It's every other time. So for us, we cannot even quantify, but it's a lot, a lot, a lot of food. I met food banking a few years ago and they have been supporting uh, Destiny Rescue Center with food, greens. They have really been of help to us. As we were going on uh, with our usual business of helping, they also were interested in uh, visiting uh, the Maasai community where I have been doing feeding programs and that is when I decided to bring them to this community. Uh, like this when we are experiencing drought, we do emergency outreach missions in areas like of Trokana, areas like of Masabit. We provide them with maize flour, we also provide the young kids with porridge flour that is very nutritious, that contains nutritions, uh, nutritious items, so that they are able to continue going to school. In Kenya, over five million people require humanitarian assistance so that they are able to continue with their daily life. Because of the over four failed rain seasons, most of the farm that we source food from actually do not have anything at the moment. Today we are privileged to host Food Bank in Kenya. They've been supporting our, our community because we are living in a, in a community that even putting food at the table is not easy. So we are so grateful to Food Bank in Kenya for remembering our communities. Most of our adult learners, they are living in a humble way and uh, give, being given food for three to three four days it's a plus to our program and after i kill naidu akulubar mlss mlss is shakula and i should go mungu sana tena mungu eme farai sisi eme kuja kunyeshewa mepata shakula yote Inashukuru, lakini sasa narudia sisi tena siku ingine nilete shakula. 
la simu nasema karibu I'd like to introduce Director of Operations and Logistics, Moses Nyoro from Pirinque. Thank you very much, Gabi. And once again, thank you so much for this particular opportunity to be in Mexico, to see other food bankers and to discuss how we can address issues in our various territories. Um, I have a very short time just to mention one or two things. Firstly, I would like to say that Kenya, the last two to three years has been affected by serious drought, where those who are in real need of food, those who are starving, have increased from two million people to 5.6 million people. And um, as a food bank, we've been looking at, we don't want to cry about the situation and what is happening, but to come in and try and intervene and see how we can contribute to addressing that particular problem. And one of the things we have done is that because some of the areas that were, had a lot of vegetables, because in 2021 we were able to rescue oh, almost 1 million kilograms of, uh, of vegetables that would have gone to waste. But last year, because of drought, we went to 50% of that. But what we have done as a food bank is that we are looking at crops that can actually endure during times of um, when there's no rain, like um, we are looking at things like um, arrow roots, um, sweet potatoes, trying to diversify our program so that we can see how we can rescue that food. At the same time, there is an innovation that we've come up with recently in Kenya where we are using solar dehydrators to actually dry vegetables um, in areas where there's a lot of vegetable production so that we can actually be able to take that, those particular vegetables to semi-arid areas. And uh, the shelf life of those vegetables, once they have been dried, can extend to after, actually one and a half years. And so we've been looking at situations where the food bank becomes a solution giver. Out of the children that we've been feeding and the, the, the schools in the homes, We've seen because of the intervention of Food Bank in Kenya, the number of children that go to school in areas that are seriously the poor areas, the poverty-stricken areas of the country, uh, the head teachers of schools are confessing that because of Food Bank in Kenya coming in to give food to those particular schools, the number of children enrolling in the schools is actually increasing. And uh, what we are doing at the moment as a food bank is helping to collect data so that we can actually be also providing data to the government on areas that need intervention. Uh, it's not been easy, as somebody mentioned here, our friend from Leket was mentioning sometimes the government takes time to respond, but we are insisting as a food bank because we want to be participators in what is actually happening. And so as a food bank, we want to be position ourselves as a you know, solution giver, solving problems. And that's what we are working on, and especially in agricultural recovery. Thank you so much. We'll talk more as we proceed. Thank you, Food Bank in Kenya. Now, we'll introduce Jomar Fleras, Executive Director, Rise Against Hunger, Philippines. Good morning, Buenos Dias. Okay, uh, I represent uh, Rise Against Hunger Philippines. Uh, the Philippines is an archipelago. Uh, we are in the Pacific Ring of Fire, and we are very prone to earthquakes and, and typhoons. In fact, the strongest typhoon recorded in history in 2013 hit us, that was Typhoon Haiyan. Our population is about 110 million uh, people, and most of the population resides in Metro Manila, which is the nation's capital. Poverty is at the rate of almost 20 million, and uh, the hunger situation is about 2.9 million Filipino families, or roughly about, um, if you multiply that by five, that's about 15 uh, million 
uh, Filipinos going hungry. Climate change and hunger affects us very, very much. Um, the Philippines is in, in the top one of the list of uh, countries vulnerable to climate change. Um, in, in, if you want to compare us with the other, in the top five, you have the US, India, China, and uh, Indonesia. But the Philippines is a very small country, so, uh, but still, we rank number one. So uh, climate change affects a lot of our agriculture and um, contributes to a lot of agriculture damage. In fact, um, last 2021, there was a, a super typhoon that hit several islands of the Philippines and it destroyed the, um, a lot of the uh, coconut plantations. And some of these uh, communities depend on coconut. So when you destroy the coconuts, it takes 10 years for them to grow. So what will happen to these people that depended on these uh, coconuts? So that's our ranking in terms of um, disaster risk. Uh, we're number one. So climate change, disaster risk, uh, that's very um, real to us. So Rise Against Hunger, we are a global um, movement to end hunger. We are a member of the Global Confederation for Ice Against Hunger. And we started our food bank only in 2019. And we became a member of GFN in 2020. We operate in practically all of the major islands of the, the country. We serve about 66 distribution partners. In 2022, we were able to distribute something like over 2 million kilos of food. Uh, to different communities. Uh, we have four tracks, in our pillars in ending hunger, nourishing lives, growing the movement, emergency relief, and empowering communities. I'd like to focus more today on our emergency relief operation. So disaster response, uh, we respond to various forms of disaster, uh, this could be earthquakes, floods, typhoons, volcanic eruptions, um, community fires. And lately, we're responding to um, an oil spill just uh, in one of the islands of our country. Um, there's a massive oil spill and several com farm, uh, fisher folk communities there were badly affected by the oil spill. So we're responding to their needs right now. So we're responding to both Man-made disasters, uh, and, and I might add also conflict. Conflict is a very real problem in the Philippines, which we have to respond to. So um, in the Philippines, uh, typhoons happen on the average about 16 times a year. And um, responding to these um, typhoons is, um, puts a lot of strains on our food bank. But we're able to reach far-flung communities by commandering, oh, well, that's our fleet. We have planes, uh, C-130, of course we don't own them. <laughs> we work with uh, the Philippine Air Force, we work with uh, the Philippine Navy so we can command their frigates on the Philippine Navy because there's no other way to reach these islands uh, unless we're able to uh, use the government's resources. It's a good thing that we have very uh, good relationships with the, the office of the president, so we're able to use the, the Air Force, the Navy, um, the military to be able to distribute food. Otherwise, um, there's no way to reach these far-flung islands. So these are just some pictures of how uh, we are able to mobilize food using the military resources. So uh, I, I have a short video which I want to share and that ends my presentation. Thank you very much.
favor. Kalipay favor. God is good. All the time. I don't know if it's because I'm a new mom, but your videos make me really emotional, so. <sighs> okay, and um, our next speaker. Thank you. Executive Director from the Asociación de Bancos de Alimentos de Colombia, Juan Carlos Buitrago Ortiz. Please come to this. Hola a todos, buenos días. Mi nombre es Juan Carlos. My name is Juan Carlos Buitrago Ortiz. I'm a physician. I'm in love with the fight against hunger, and I am the. I'm very fortunate to be right now the director of the Colombian Food Banking Network, and I'm going to tell you how our banks organize in order to respond to emergencies, and we're going to tell it to you with a real example of an emergency that we had in the uh, country when Hurricane Leota went through our country in 2020, how we responded to Hurricane Iota. We will, uh, this is a video, that was real. It was taken by CNN at that time. Never such powerful hurricane had reached the islands of San Andres and Providencia. Iota's winds it's a cyclone category five, the largest, highest number on the scale. It uh, hit really with big fury the uh, Colombia archipelago. The situation, the issues caused by Iona did not have any precedent in the history of the country. There was the president of Colombia. Uh, the infrastructure has been badly impacted. We're talking about 98% of infrastructure damaged. Uh, the president said that even though the uh, storm had gone over the island already, the uh, maritime conditions were still too difficult for ships, for Navy ships to reach in Providencia. Hurricane Ayora went through Colombia in October of 2020 uh, along the Colombian Caribbean, affected over 300 municipalities in Colombia. Over 60,000 families were affected by the hurricane. It affected many municipalities in Colombia, but specifically the archipelago, where we have we have three islands. One of those three islands was totally devastated. 98% of the infrastructure disappeared. Uh, Colombian food banks, well, we're 24 banks. Last year, we rescued over 30,000 tons of food. We purchased close to 8,000 tons, and with that 38,000 tons, we improved the nutrition of 1.2 million people in a situation of vulnerability. The food banks in Colombia, about five years ago, we got organized. We designed a protocol for emergency response. We learned that if we have to respond to an emergency and we are not in coordination with the private sector and with government, we're uh, duplicating efforts. We are reaching many families twice, and then other families are not reached at all. So five years ago, we implemented a protocol. This is the official country protocol to activate the private sector in the context of an emergency. What does this mean? In Colombia, the private sector is part of an association. It's the uh, Entrepreneurs Association or Corporation Association of Colombia. When there is a national emergency, this association, together with the Food Banking Network, we are all called to uh, activate uh, the whole private sector and to organize the logistics from the private sector and in their response to emergencies. And this is important because uh, normally, at least in our countries, the private sector can reach faster than the government. So we're able to respond quickly to emergency, uh, an emergency until the government comes. So uh, 
uh, within the framework of this protocol, when uh, Hurricane Iota hit, we all got organized, we mobilized. First of all, we needed to see how many people were affected, how many people were in shelters, how many people were uh, locked in place, or how many people moved or relocated to a neighbor's home or other place. Uh, these people normally are not assisted by the government, but that's the people that we have to uh, serve in, in the context of an emergency. So the people who are normally in the surrounding areas, to the most of the areas, also need humanitarian help. So. Second, we organize the logistics of the assistance program. We define, you know, from the three major cities in the country, activated all the private sector and food banks. We mobilized food. We sent it from those three major urban centers. We worked with transportation companies who are our partners. We also started taking uh, by uh, airplane some of the islands affected by iota uh, some of those islands are 720 kilometers or, or like uh, 450 miles away from the urban centers so we had the three uh, points where we gather the supplies uh, we started uh, taking supplies to san andres and the uh, closest urban center was cartagena at the time so we uh, moved food to cartagena and then through a uh, private uh, shipper, we were able, private shipping company, we were able to take uh, food by boat to the island of San Andres. What does that mean? Uh, what does the protocol mean? Well, if we are organized, we know who has to call the companies, where the companies deliver the food, how does it reach the food banks. Uh, we also have a uh, an advertising or publicity campaign through social media, etc. cetera. Uh, how do we collect funds? how it's going to be invested sometimes you know, pretty much every time we have to pay for logistical services so all of that is contemplated in the emergency protocol so at those times we activated the protocol we launched a video in 2020 to call on all colombians all the private companies to help in within this uh, context of the tragedy with iota uh, this is uh, uh, Hurricane Iona going through the Colombian Caribbean. It affected 308 municipalities. Over 60,000 families have lost uh, everything. Uh, whole communities didn't have any water or electricity. It's time to respond. So uh, visit now. Abaco, the food bank. With your donation, Colombia's food banks can take basic staples and uh, basic uh, needed products to the most affected areas. Colombia needs you. United we can. This was the campaign that we launched uh, with other elements we already have uh, something ready. Well, I'm going to tell you about that. So we started uh, articulating this campaign. Um, we uh, mobilized for the emergency. Within that uh, emergency framework in the country, we were able to uh, distribute 966 tons of food, not only to San Andres, but all the whole country. We benefited 70,000, over 70,000 people. Uh, we had 92 donors that responded at that time in San Andres and Providencia, the most affected islands. We delivered 292 tons of products and 10,962 people benefited. And we see some logos at the bottom. We mobilized many private companies, uh, shipping companies, transportation companies uh, that helped us during this emergency. At that time, we had in the islands a small food bank. In Colombia, Colombia we call it an initiative bank, and a, a startup bank. They didn't have uh, uh, vehicles or anything, but what we did is we strengthened that uh, food bank in San Andres. Uh, we quickly obtained resources so they could have a, a truck, a vehicle. Uh, today, uh, the San Andres Food Bank, and that's a small island, they delivered last year 121 tons of food. 
they uh, took care of 666 vulnerable persons. Uh, San Andres doesn't have any agriculture, doesn't have any uh, restaurants or anything. So we have to send food to San Andres from the interior of the country, from food banks. So we got organized and we delivered food there uh, to San Andres. Now, final recommendations, three big ones. One, you need to have a protocol before the emergency. I mean, we have to be organized beforehand, something that... Uh, organizes the the banks the the food banking network and at the very minimum we need to contemplate how much food we're going to request when we have an emergency uh, cleaning supplies for example and uh, also we should define what the uh, uh, channels are going to be to collect uh, resources if we have a landing page if we have uh, accounts how are we organized logistically? What's the call chain? If there's an emergency at 2 in the morning, who's going to call whom? How we get the whole organization mobilized to respond in time? If the protocol, besides organizing what the food banks do, if it can organize also, bring some order to what the private sector does, is extraordinary. So we have in our protocol uh, established who calls the private sector, who organizes all of those calls, and how the private sector provides us with donations. But if the protocol can also articulate and uh, coordinate with the uh, government action, it's, it's an exceptional thing. Because in this emergency, the government immediately put at our disposal uh, all the airplanes of the Air Force, and you know, that's a much larger capacity than, than the private fleets. So we were able to move uh, and bring uh, large items to San Andres. Um, now, that's the first thing, the protocol. Second, those logistic alliances or partnerships have to be established before. Who is going to move uh, products uh, on land, uh, 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 maritime uh, transportation etc and three a campaign it'd be great if we could have a campaign ready as an example in Colombia we have problems every year when we have the, the winter winter problems and people are uh, hurt all over the country we have a campaign ready every year so a campaign can be structured before can be ready before since I have 20 seconds <laughs> and this is not about the protocol. We're going to invite you to our booth here at the uh, backpack program. We have a program in Colombia to serve the most vulnerable. We want to show you that. We have an ex a virtual reality experience. So you can go to the Guajira. You can understand the situation with hunger there in the region of the Guajira. We are expecting uh, pretty soon the news that we're going to be the first NGO organization in Colombia that's going to have a space in the metaverse so everybody can understand what a food bank does in the metaverse and how we help the most vulnerable. Thank you very much.